There was one problem in all of this, because while she wanted everyone to believe that, that she was a, a woman of worth and substance, Vanity Fair was having a real problem because their scrupulous researchers couldn't find any evidence of Megan's global philanthropy and activism. Those in the public eye, Vanity Fair's editors had discovered, sometimes found difficulty living up to their self-created publicity. So many times when these actors would come in and say that all these things about them, the fact checkers had a job ahead of them to prove that all of their little pieces that their agencies had been throwing out about them were nothing but a smokescreen and the, sub the substance was never there. The same thing was true and what they were finding to be true about Megan. Graydon Carter, the editor of the magazine, said that Hollywood philanthropy is PR philanthropy. Actors, he said, often have a superficial rather than a deep commitment to their charity work. Some, you know, some would call it the liberal Hollywood zeitgeist, you know, just go, go with the flow and see, appear like you've got all this charity work and, you know, all these good deeds that you're doing for everybody, but there's no reason to really do it, but as long as everybody thinks that's what you're doing, then you're good. Eventually, the fable threatened to consume the person. Kaylee Thomas Morgan gave the impression she expected that reality to be glossed over. So Sunshine Sachs said to Vanity Fair, okay, you might very well not be able to find, you know, some real hardcore evidence that she's this philanthropist, but there's no reason to really say anything about it. I mean, just that's what we know her to be. That's what we believe her to be. Like, just what, what what's the harm? I mean, she's going to get to more serious work when she was with Harry anyway. So just, you know, keep, you, people need to know that she's like a source for that so that they can hire her for more things and for, for more charity work and, you know, get her name on more charity. So there's no reason to expose her. You don't need to be like that about it. Of course, Sunshine Sachs is all in the business of hiding the truth. So they would have expected other publications to do their bidding also. We did get you this interview, so you need to play you need to play ball. Well, reading Castor's completed interview, Vanity Fair's editors knew the article was a huge coup for the magazine. The familiar and well rehearsed profile gush about the dilemma of ticking the race box at school, the mixed race dolls, the Los Angeles riots was good color. But her revelation about Harry was what was sensational. Because really, who cares about all that same stuff she's always said in all her speeches anyway? We already know all that. We already know all about the race riots, the box ticking, ticking the mixed race dolls. Like, none of that is news. These are her same stories. This is all she ever says. So who cares about that? The real thing, that the, the real meat of the story, the crux of the entire thing was those lines that she gave where a couple were in love. And that was guaranteed front page headlines. Megan's interview took the royal family into uncharted waters. Intentionally, she had revealed her master plan. As the magazine was printed, Megan was celebrating her 36th birthday with Harry in Botswana. Accompanied by a team of bodyguards, she had traveled like royalty and was cared for like the princess she soon expected to be. Megan had brought with her a bots to Botswana a copy of Pride, which it's a small magazine. Um, it's aimed at mixed race and black Britons. The magazine featured an interview with her. Um, she described her fight against racial, racial prejudice and the importance of female empowerment delivered by appointing women to senior positions. As a woman of color, she told the magazine, she felt an obligation to speak about being half black. Vanity Fair, she imagined, would blast her same message across the globe. So she couldn't wait for that. You know, she was excited to be in that Pride magazine, but what she really couldn't wait for was the Vanity Fair article, which of course, who that would be the bigger one to be excited about. But she thought that Vanity Fair would play with her the same way that Pride had played with her and let her say what she wanted to say and print it as she said it. Well, pre-publication copies of the magazine were released to Sunshine Sacks and to Buckingham Palace in September. The front page picture was stunning. It's a very pretty picture of Megan and uh, was covered by the headline, she's just wild about Harry. Well, that's not what they agreed she would say. And of course she wanted to say, oh, it's just the words from an old song, but a song that no one really knows anymore. Like, what are you talking about? She's just wild about Harry. Like, what does that have to do? Like, no one would think that had anything to do with anything other than her relationship with Harry. That doesn't mean anything other than her relationship with Harry.
Meghan's unprecedented brazenness took Buckingham Palace by surprise and electrified the British media. Like a thunderclap, the interview triggered sensational reactions. Meghan had used her relationship with Harry to promote herself. The Hollywoodization of the royal family had sealed Meghan's fate as Harry's fiance. How was this close to anything she'd promised Harry when she said she was gonna do the interview? He had begged her not to do this, not to do the very thing that she then went ahead and did. The breach of trust there was enormous. And I, I just, he just doesn't, he just doesn't have the strength of character to be with a Meghan Markle. And if I had been him, I would have just been so angry that this had happened. After I told you not to do this, this is what you choose to do. Why, why would you do that? Like I would just feel so betrayed. Well, he must have said something to her because now she's hysterical. Um, she's hysterical because the palace is upset with her, but I think more importantly, she would have been hysterical because Harry was upset with her. Um, the palace has always been upset with her and she's just smiled and gone on her pretty little way. She doesn't care what they think. She cares, she cares what Harry thinks because Harry could break up with her if he got into his head that he actually had some power in this relationship. Unfortunately, he just doesn't realize how much power he has. Within hours, Megan called Ken Sunshine and Kaylee Thomas Morgan. Hysterically, she described Buckingham Palace's fury at Wild about Harry. Sunshine Sachs, said Megan, should have ensured that her comments about Harry were removed. Why didn't you say, okay, I'll tell you the truth. We are together, but don't write that. We're not supposed to talk about it. You know, I can understand wanting to reveal that to the interviewer because if you are truly in a relationship with somebody and you're excited about it, you want to talk about it. So I'm not saying, why did you even want to mention it? I'm with Ken Sunshine here. Hey, it was your responsibility not to bring it up. You were told not to do it. If you give that journalist any hint that he can say it, he's going to print it. That's way too big a tidbit for him to not want to drop that bombshell. It was incumbent upon you to make sure that those words didn't come out of your mouth. And if they did, for you to be like, this is absolutely off the record, you cannot print this. Um, but more importantly, just don't say it. Anyway, she did. Um, and Ken again reprimanded her. If you wanted it to be about philanthropy and activism, that's what you should have been talking about, okay? Harry should never have come into play, so you can't be mad at them now. You all but gave your permission to it, so don't come at us hysterically. We can't do anything about it now that it is going to print. Um, but Sunshine, Ken Sunshine was worried that Megan would fire his agency because she was that angry about it. And she's illogical. I mean, when she wants a certain thing and it doesn't happen, she doesn't have any problem uh, pinning it on somebody and pinning it on circumstances that don't actually make any sense. So he decides that he better mind his P's and Q's. He was puzzled why Buckingham Palace was angry. And he called the magazine's editor to deliver what he imagined to be the ultimate threat. You're going to have to deal with the queen on this, he said. He imagined, as though the queen doesn't have bigger fish to fry, that the furious monarch would pick up the phone and berate the editor. Like she would even bother. The editor was bemused. Megan, Ken Sunshine was told, didn't get the cover in her own name or as a feminist, but because she was likely to marry Harry. So don't come at us like we are somehow off the rails by using the fact that she mentioned Harry. You think we cared about Meghan Markle? You think we care about the 100th episode of a show nobody watches except for its little cult following? We wouldn't put that face on the cover of our magazine. Of course it was about Harry and she gave us the go and we took it. Don't come at us. So Meghan is completely destabilized by all the furor and she texts Kashner, this super manipulative, ridiculous statement. Gutted and deflated. I'm very disappointed in you because I thought that this could have been an actual friendship. I don't now think that that can happen. And then she implied that he had queered the deal with Harry, whatever that means. Those are his words. Kashner, she implied, had queered the deal with Harry. 
Okay. This text, I'm very disappointed in you. I thought we could be friends, but now I don't think so. Also, I'm not gonna invite you to my birthday party. It's like, all right, let me schedule some time to feel bad about that. Like, like he was all, you know, gunning for a relationship with this weirdo who keeps pictures of herself on her own kitchen walls, has stacks of books about the city that her boyfriend lives in, which she's never cracked the cover of, and invites random people in in the middle of an interview. Like, what exactly did she think had transpired in this interview in which she insulted him for his stutter? That he was just dying for a second dose of that. The grandiosity that is her ego knows no bounds. Can you imagine? Like, I would have just laughed my head off if I got this text. I thought we could be friends, but now I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Let me wipe the tears out of my eyes. I don't know how I'm going to go on. Okay. Um, Kashner is shocked that she's upset. Like, what are you mad about? The, it was a blatant puff piece. Like, it was all about, you know, letting her star shine. So what is she so mad about? She's not mad at anybody but herself. Because Harry's mad at her. Because Harry's saying, I told you not to do that. Why did you do that to me? I can't trust you. I thought that if I said, please don't do this, you wouldn't do it. And then you just run right over and you use blab everything. You weren't given permission to do that. I asked you not to. So she's not mad that it's all about her and Harry. It's that she is for the first time getting a little grief and worrying that she uh, might have shot herself in the foot. But it can't be her fault. So it's gotta be Kashner's fault. Um, she says that she hated the title Wild About Harry. And she said she was trying to promote her philanthropy. That These are the excuses she gives. I was trying to promote my philanthropy and then you made it all about the guy I'm dating and I'm a feminist and I don't need to be defined by the relationship that I have with men. She was equally frustrated that her childhood battle with Procter & Gamble had been omitted. She felt that that was so important. That was like the mast on this ship of a narrative that she tells about herself, that she at such an early age could spot um, abuse and she knew when women were being mistreated and that even at the young age of 11, she had the guts to come out and speak up for women because that's who she really is. That's what she's all about. So for them to omit it, she thought was unfair. And she said that they, that they were entirely focused on the thing with Harry and made no mention of what a feminist she'd always been. Kashner resisted revealing that the Vanity Fair fact checkers had adamantly decided that her story was possibly false. After consulting Procter and Gamble and advertising historians, the fact checkers concluded there was no proof that the incident had ever happened. There was also no evidence as Megan claimed that she had received a reply from Hillary Clinton. Unknown to Kashner, Thomas Markle knew that both Hillary Clinton and Procter and Gamble had ignored Megan's letters. Her campaign was fictitious, invented by an adoring father. And of course, we, we went over that way early in the beginning of this book when we were reviewing it, but Vanity Fair was right to exclude that. There was no proof that that was a true story. Their reputation is incumbent on the fact that their fact checkers get it right. So she's mad that they aren't willing to just keep up with the false lies and the false stories that she's told. But if she would have actually pour herself into real work, real advocacy work, real philanthropy, she wouldn't have to still be relying on the sad sack story from way back when she was 11. The fact that at this late stage of her life, she's still having to recall that story speaks volumes, even if that story had been true. It speaks volumes on how little she's used her platform at this age. She, that shouldn't still be something she has to talk about. She should have so many more things and so many better things that would, would completely consume that story. Why is she still talking about back when I was 11? Yeah, but you're 36 now. Some time has, has, has passed. Let's, let's talk about some things we've done as a big girl. Okay, well, she complained because she wasn't presented in the way she wanted, recalled Kashner. She demanded that the media do what she expects. I felt manipulated and betrayed. Vanity Fair did, however, agree to one correction. Megan insisted that she had met Harry in July and not in May. 
The magazine published the change, but unknowingly collaborated with a smokescreen about their relationship inspired by Megan. Megan insisted on the change, and this is why. Because there was speculation that mid, that because there was speculation that until mid-July, she was still living with Corey, the chef. So she wanted it to be incredibly clear that those relationships had not overlapped. We know they did. But of all the things that she insisted to be changed, I find that to be incredibly telling that the dates of her relationship with Harry were more important to her than making sure that they followed up about back when I was a kid and my Procter and Gamble story. If she could get them to change something, why didn't she press that issue? Because Kashner didn't even tell her the Vanity Fair fact checkers don't think that's true. He, he just said, well, we didn't go that way with the story. He didn't even tell her why they didn't. It's, it's interesting to me she didn't push more for that. But instead, it's, all right, fine, well, then get the dates right, you know? Okay, well, as the anger subsided, Megan reconsidered her fate. The producers and cast of Suits were awestruck that an actor from their cult series with a mere 1.5 million audience had made Vanity Fair's cover. Their only disappointment was that the royal relationship did not improve their ratings, not by a single percentage See, now this flies in the face of what I had said last episode, because I said, man, it's shocking they wouldn't want to keep her on. I'd think that having somebody so close to the Royals would bring more views to their show. But even as the Vanity Fair cover's coming out, even as people are knowing Megan is uh, with Harry, that's not making more people watch the show, not even a little bit. So I was wrong to think that there could have been some hope for them. On the positive side, Harry remained utterly loyal. That is shocking to me. Why? Why? Somebody explain to me why, why, why did Harry decide that he wanted to stay after this breach of trust? I think, and this is the only thing I can think, is one, he was, for whatever reason, very attracted to her. I think that he felt like she brought something to his life he could not bring to his own. I think that there was a part of him that really enjoyed being on the other side of getting to play the race card. So many times it had been him on the being uh, accused of racism and boy has he said some things. He said some real weird things. Somebody said to me in the comments that when he was asked about Chelsea, somebody said, you know, what do you think about uh, Chelsea being from Africa? And he said, well, it's not like she's black. I mean, that's, that's racist. <laughs> I mean... You know, calling people names that are racial slurs, dressing up as a Nazi. I mean, like, he said so many things in his past that are so questionable that for him to now be able to rest on his moral laurels and call everybody else out and act like he's just this stunning voice for uh, race, racial reconciliation must have been too good an opportunity to refuse for his own ego. So, I mean, all I can think is that he enjoyed the fight with her. Like, not the, the fight they were having, but the fight like it's us against the world. It must have given him this sense of, of importance and superiority. Um, now, so Harry's loyal. Um, as Sarah Vine, a Daily Mail columnist, concluded, Megan had ticked this box and uh, customized her relationship as a new chapter. Left unanswered was Vine's rhetorical question. Did Megan imagine that joining the Windsors was just another spicy chapter in her life, but on the grander stage? Reversing the narrative was impossible. Through Kashner... Megan had made clear to Buckingham Palace that she would be unwilling to obey their rules. Protocol was irrelevant for her. Unlike the other young women who married the Windsors, she would not remain silent. And come hell or high water, no one was going to make her. In London, Harry's family and their senior advisors were subdued. This looked like a storm they were going to have to weather. This was not an issue, as some would later assert, about the palace's handling or mismanagement of Meghan. Nothing could be done. The besotted prince ignored the warnings that Meghan spelled trouble for the palace. So that also flies in the face of some of my earlier assertions saying, why didn't somebody stop her from being part of the family? Were they just too busy with other things? Why didn't somebody do something? Well, what could they have done? She was willing to just be a loose cannon and he was willing to stand there and hold her hand and be like, well, yeah, me too. You know, it's like, he didn't care. He didn't care to change anything. 